Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is preemptive war. I cover this in chapter six of The Rationality of War. Check the video description for more information about that. Now, the big question that we're interested in addressing today is how do first strike advantages lead to war? Remember that preventive war and preemptive war are distinctly different here. In preventive war, we were talking about power shifting over the course of time. And in preemptive war, we are talking about first strike advantages. Now recall back that as always, as long as the distribution of power is stable and there are costs of fighting, then there exists a bargaining range and any settlement within that bargaining range is mutually preferable to war. But we've implicitly assumed here that this probability of a victory, A's victory is PA, is not changing in who declares war. It doesn't matter who declares war, A is always winning with probability PA and B is always winning with probability 1 minus PA. But that's a, that's a critical assumption to the model. What if we change that? What if we made the probability of victory no longer constant of who starts the war? So we're going to make first strike advantages exist. There's an element of surprise here, and if I decide to fight you before you decide to fight me, then I get to dictate where we're going to fight. So there's some distinct advantages here to striking first, and it's possible that this may cause our peaceful result to break down and thus giving us another explanation or another rationalist explanation for war. So as it turns out, we will get a new rationalist explanation for war here as long as the first strike advantages are sufficiently large. And to see this, we're going to go back to the days when we were talking about the algebraic model, and we're going to work with that here. So the model is going to look like this. We're going to suppose that the states must choose whether to preempt or bargain before they actually sit down at the bargaining table. So if you're a state, you get to decide, all right, do I want to talk things out with my opponent, or do I just want to go ahead and start a fight right now? If I'm starting a fight right now, then I'm preempting. If I'm actually sitting down at the bargaining table, then I'm bargaining. So if both preempt or both bargain and bargaining fails, then A is still winning with probability PA. So there's no advantage if we both attack at the same time, whether it's because bargaining broke down or because we never even tried bargaining. However, if A preempts, if A tries to launch a first strike against B and B is trying to bargain and so they're not prepared for this first strike, then the states will fight a war and A is now going to win with probability PA plus delta PA, where this delta PA represents the additional probability of victory that A gets from striking first. And in contrast, B is now going to win with probability 1 minus PA plus CB if B preempts and A bargains. So whoever is striking first when the other one is bargaining is gaining this inherent advantage, this delta factor, this value of delta, which represents the first strike advantage. And war is still going to be costly, and to keep things simple, we're going to make it just as costly as in a regular war, so CA and CB are going to remain constant regardless of who starts the war or when the war uh, actually begins. All right. So the model in question here is suppose that X is the outcome of bargaining. Suppose that if we do sit down at the bargaining table, then X will be the outcome of the negotiations where state A is receiving X of the good and state B is receiving one minus X of the good. Then does there exist an X such that the states individually prefer the bargained outcome to preemption? So let's look at this dilemma from both states' perspectives, starting with A. Assume that the other guy is going to bargain here. So assume that B is going to sit down at the bargaining table and A knows that. Would A want to sit down at the bargaining table in response to knowing that B is going to sit down at the bargaining table? Well, if A preempts, its expected utility is PA minus CA plus delta A. So this is the probability of victory under normal circumstances plus the first strike advantage minus the costs of fighting CA. That's what the state A will receive if it decides to launch a surprise attack against B. In contrast, we've assumed that X is the outcome of the bargaining game if they both sit down on the bargaining table. So A will receive X if they both sit down at the table. All right. So that means bargaining is acceptable to A if the amount that A will receive at the bargaining table, X, is greater than or equal to its value for preemption, PA minus CA minus delta A. It's just these two things combined together. So that's A's dilemma. A is going to be willing to sit down at a bargaining table if that holds. What about B? Well, B's dilemma, again, we're going to assume that the other guy, this in this case A, is going to be sitting down at the bargaining table. And so the expected utility for B, if it launches a surprise attack, is 1 minus PA. That's the probability that B would win a war under normal circumstances, plus the additional probability of victory, the first strike advantage delta, minus the cost of fighting for B, CB. So that's A's, or rather B's expected utility for fighting. Now, if B were to bargain instead to forego the first strike advantage, then when they sit down at the bargaining table, B will get 1 minus X. 
That's the remainder of the amount that A is getting. Remember, A gets X and B gets the remainder, or 1 minus X. That's essentially 100% of the good minus A's percentage of the good. So that means bargaining is acceptable if we just put these two things together. One is this at least as good as that. Well, it's when 1 minus X is greater than or equal to 1 minus PA minus CB plus delta CB. Again, it's just coming from these two things right here. And so if we solve for X, as long as X is less than or equal to PA plus CB minus delta B, then B is willing to bargain. Essentially, A can receive no more than that amount for B to be happy with the remainder. All right, so now we just combine those last two slides together. A mutually acceptable bargain exists if this holds. If PA minus CA plus delta A is less than or equal to X, which is less than or equal to PA plus CB minus CB. So that just came from the last two slides where we got here and here. If we combine those two things together, then we get this set of inequalities. And such an X will exist, such a bargain will exist as long as this is less than or equal to this. So we essentially just cut out the X from the set of inequalities to leave us with one inequality. And now we can do some simplifying here because we have a PA on both sides. And so we get as long as the delta A plus the delta B is less than or equal to the cost of A plus the cost of B, then a mutually preferable bargain does in fact exist. And to turn that into English here, the first strike advantages, if the first strike advantages are smaller than the cost of fighting, then a mutually acceptable bargain exists. So remember that delta A is A's first strike advantage, delta B is B's first strike advantage. If you sum those first strike advantages together and they're less than or equal to the cost of fighting, the sum cost of fighting, then a mutually preferable bargain exists. Now to see this visually, Again, we're going to refer back to the old school bargaining range, the simplified version that we talked about in the geometric model. Now we need to add some additional variables here. Specifically, we need to add each side's first strike advantage. So first let's look at A's first strike advantage. So the value of A's first strike advantage I'm making here is sized delta A, and it's going to be the length of this blue line. So we're adding this amount to A's probability of victory. So if you take this and you add that to it, that shifts this probability of victory if A is preempting over to here. And after you subtract for the costs of fighting, then we get to here. So that's PA plus delta A minus CA. This red line represents how much A expects to receive if it preempts, which is a lot more than it would expect to get under a war in normal circumstances, which is this amount right here. In fact, it's delta A more. It, that's how much it increases by is the first strike advantage. All right, so basically what's going on here is if A is going to be willing to sit down at the bargaining table, it has to receive this much, at least this much through bargaining. Now let's add in B's first strike advantage. So suppose B has a first strike advantage. Again, we're going to make it sized delta B, and that's going to be the size of the blue line. So that's going to shift the probability of victory for B closer to A's capital. So that means we have to move the probability of victory down to represent the fact that this is better for the side that has the capital over here, state B. So that means we're moving this value here, PA minus delta CB. So we're moving it over and then we are adding the costs back. So essentially what's going on is this line is moving to here and then this line is moving to here. So we're just moving things. We're shifting both of these values, PA and PA plus CB over to the left by a value delta B, which is B's first strike advantage or the size of this blue line here. So that means B's reservation value for war is the size of this red line. If B is going to be willing to sit down on the bargaining table, then it must receive at least this amount out of the bargain. Now, if we get rid of all of the extraneous information here, and we just look at how much each side needs to receive to be willing to sit down on the bargaining table, we're going to see that there's a problem. So if remember, this line right here is the amount that A needs to receive. This line right here is the amount that B needs to receive. The entire length of the slide from here to here is the value of all the goods. It's 100% of the goods from here to here. And we see that the sum of this and this extends greater than the length of the slide, right? Because there's some overlap here. That means there is no bargaining range. It means that we need to have more goods than exist in order to be able to satisfy both sides. We need more than 100% of the goods to be able to buy off both parties simultaneously. Obviously, we can't do that. And so that means the states are going to be fighting. And note, that when the states fight, we still have inefficiency because now the first strike advantages are negated. Both sides are fighting a war just as they had under normal circumstances. So A is winning with probability PA, but A is paying this cost CA. So it's receiving this amount, the value of this red line. B is paying its cost CB. And so it's getting that value, the value of that red line. And we see that there's some dead weight loss here 
both sides are paying the costs, but it's going to neither side. So this is bad for the world. This is bad for the system because there do exist bargains that are mutually preferable to war. It's just that we can't hold on to them. We can't hold or credibly commit to them over the course of time because as soon as we decide that one side is going to sit down at the bargaining table, the other side has incentive to go ahead and launch a first strike and take advantage of that fact. So that's a bad outcome from both parties. And yet, nevertheless, you have to live with it because the alternatives just won't work out over time. All right. The last remaining question to address here is whether this is actually a realistic explanation for war. It certainly works in theory, but does it actually occur in reality? After all, wars tend to be really, really costly. And remember, in order for war to be rational here, the first strike advantages have to outweigh the costs. So the question that remains is, empirically speaking, do first strike advantages really outweigh the costs? And the answer that the literature sort of has, has come to a conclusion here is that the answer is probably not. It seems that this isn't a really good explanation for war for only looking at first strike advantages, that first strike advantages tend not to be enough to cause war on their own. But the presence of first strike advantages shrinks the bargaining range regardless. So even if the bargaining range, or rather, even if the first strike advantages aren't particularly large, but they still exist, then the presence of those first strike advantages shrinks the bargaining range, which in turn makes it easier for other rationalist explanations for war to cause problems. So the idea of preventive war or information problems or issue indivisibilities, those things can flare up more often as long as there are first strike advantages, even if the first strike advantages alone are not sufficient for war. So that is preemptive war in a nutshell. It's also this idea of unitary actor explanations for war in a nutshell that we've gone through all of those lectures now. And we now have a good understanding of how bargaining relates to war and how if states are unitary actors, how even if they are unbiased, they have unbiased leaders that aren't self-motivated, that these guys can still find reasons to fight each other, even in the presence of self or even in the lack of a presence of any selfish purpose for from these leaders. So that takes care of that and it takes care of the unit. We're done with that unit. And starting in the next video, we will look at the other end of the cooperative versus non-cooperative spectrum. So in these videos, we've been looking at times when states have competing preferences and don't really want to work with each other, but only have incentive to work with each other because, well, war is costly and they want to avoid it. In contrast, in the next unit, we're going to be looking at trade where states really do have a lot of incentive to work together and these strictly competitive aspects don't particularly work out nearly as well. And, and so there's really a lot more reason to be optimistic about cooperation when we look at trade. So I hope you enjoyed this unit on the rationality of war. I do encourage you to check out that book because that book will have all of these examples in much greater detail and a whole lot more information. So it's pretty cheap and I think a good investment in both your terms of cost and in your time. And until next time, uh, take care and I will see you in the next video on trade.